this morning, uh, and uh, we're missing a section. Uh, the campus are away uh, at a campus retreat, and uh, so uh, we're missing them today, but we know they're having a fantastic time uh, this morning, and so it would help if I had my slides up and ready. Please stand by. All right, we'll try this one more time. Um, well, it's great to be here. The teens just got back from the winter retreat and uh, entitled Uprising. That was an amazing, amazing time together. And uh, that was, that was uh, just amazing. The thing that blew me away is how talented the teens are. K-Sam and Bree, they, specifically K-Sam, put together this showcase. It was like blow away. It was like singing and dancing and lacrosse sticking and like it was it was amazing. It's just so much talent. Uh, so it was uh, it was amazing. Uh, I have to give it up for K-Sam and Bree because they did a absolutely mind-blowing job uh, putting together the winter retreat. Uh, Sean and Franny who oversee the teens in the north did an amazing job. All the counselors did a fantastic. Um, and again, we'll try it one more time. Going once. On mine, it looks great. <laughs> if, you, if you're wondering, on mine, it looks great. Um, but no, I, I, uh, we had a great time. Also, uh, today, I want to throw this out there. Today is the last day for early bird registration at the family conference. So make sure you get it today. The price jumps way up. Uh, so make sure that you, uh, you, you uh, take uh, advantage of the low prices. We have over 500 people already registered. Uh, so usually when you start a new conference, there's like five or 600 people. You got a crazy good uh, showing. You have about, uh, you know, seven, 800 people. Uh, we're on pace for roughly over a thousand uh, for the first ever family conference. So we're really excited about that. Amen. Uh, today, I'm going to try my best without these slides um, to uh, preach part two, a few weeks ago I preached generational lift, and we talked about spiritual drift on an individual level and spiritual lift, and the things that help get us off track spiritually, and the things that kind of lift us up and help us grow closer to God in our in our relationship with God. So this morning uh, I want to talk a little bit about something that's kind of big picture kind of stuff. Uh, here in Denver we we're coming up with this approach called Cradle to Campus, and um, it's uh, super. Still not working. We'll try one more time, and then I'm just going to shut it. And Oh, I have, I have, like, people coming to help. They're like, yes, this is awesome. They're like, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I broke it. So um, don't pay any attention to this area. So, um, so what we're going to talk about is this aspect in Denver. We're coming up with this idea of uh, cradle to campus. And I want to talk. All oh, right. This is awesome. I want to talk about why this is important in particular. Um, because for, for a long time, our church in Denver and our family of churches or our fellowship of churches have always been really passionate about like taking the gospel of Jesus to the ends of the earth. Like, we've been fired up. We're like, man, God has loved us. God has shown us so much grace. How can we not share this with everybody else? I mean, how many of us, when we became a Christian, felt like this is the best thing that's ever happened to me? And how many people, like, when I, don't, I didn't grow up religious, so when I became a Christian, I'm like, I was like dumbfounded. I didn't get it. I was like, why isn't everybody doing this? And I know I was young and naive at 19, but I'm like, like, people, do they not know? Like, cause we, if we just, we just need to do like a TV show on like, like, like part one, seeking God. Part, I mean, I think we can, we can knock this out. I mean, because surely if people see this, I mean, it's the best thing. And that's how I felt. And probably how a lot of you felt when you became Christians. But what we figured out is, is that it's a lot harder to get to the ends of the earth than we thought. Because it takes a lot more than just us in our generation to really make it happen. Because even if we get to all of the big cities, we still got to get to all the little towns and all the little villages. And that takes not just a generation, it takes all generations. 
And I love what Frank was sharing back in Reach uh, last year at our big conference when he was like, you know, the Bible has two kind of mandates. One is to the ends of the earth, but the other one is to all generations because to all generations is the key to getting to the ends of the earth. Are you guys with me here? When we think about even in the Bible about Paul, who was the greatest missionary who ever lived, who wrote most of the New Testament, what would he be without Titus and Timothy? Eliminate that generation and Paul just say, hey, I got to do it. It's me and Peter and the boys. We got to do this. But what happens if you take out that other generation? It didn't work back then and it won't work today. So we've got to figure out how not just to get to the ends of the earth, but basically to all generations. And we got to get them going at the same time. And a lot of people is like, okay, I'm going to run, and then we're going to pass off the baton to the next generation. Could you imagine, like, Paul being like, okay, well, Timothy's leading Ephesus. I started in Acts 19, but uh, oh, anybody else feel like they need retirement? Uh, wrote most of the New Testament, sent out Titus to Crete, got Timothy in Ephesus. I'm good. Let the young guys do it. Like, no, 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 no. We need all the generations going at the same time because if not, we're going to see a generational drift instead of a generational lift. And the challenge is, is that we see this a lot in the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you really can't see it great. But if you look up there, we start in Joshua 24. So flip over to Joshua 24 for me. When Joshua and Caleb were taking the promised land, They were fired up, man. They were going to do this. And we see that spirit as they recall what had happened in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 13, where the Bible reads, Joshua 24, 13 says, So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities that you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness, Throw away the gods of your forefathers, worship beyond the river um, and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. And what had happened is Joshua just recounted all the ways God had taken his generation, him and Caleb, and been faithful to them and conquered the promised land. Amen? And so it's like, yeah, we did it. We conquered the promised land. This is awesome. Look what God did. And now we just need to continue to serve God, and it's amazing. But then if you kind of jump down to verse 16, This is the response of the next generation. In verse 24, it says, And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. Excuse me, I'm on the wrong spot. 16, Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers, this is the second generation, up out of Egypt from the land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. And so we see the second generation, and and they basically agreed with Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were like, God is awesome. God can do anything. God has delivered us. God is amazing. Look what all God's done. And the next generation was like, yeah, okay, yeah. Sounds good. We'll go with that. But then if you look at the next generation, look what happens in Judges chapter 2. Look to Judges, just a couple of pages gingerly. If you get page turning happy, you're going you're to miss it. And then if you got your phone, you have no problems. Judges chapter 2 and verse 7 says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him. And, all, and, and who, and who had, had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. So as long as they were alive, that first generation, everything was kind of good. Now look in verse 10. After that, whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. You see, this kind of happens. It's like we become Christians and like I'm kind of a first generation Christian. Like nobody in my family is religious or goes to church or reads their Bible or really pursues a relationship with God. And so I'm kind of in my family, I'm like first generation. I'm a pioneer, man. I'm like, we're going to do this. We're going to change the world. I'm going to live with a purpose. I'm going to pass on this purpose to my kids. 
But if I'm not careful, my kids will do what the second generation do. It goes, sounds good. Had a good life. I'll go with it. And they'll just kind of, they'll kind of bandwagon jump. You know how that is, right? We seem to be winning. We'll keep going with it. And they'll jump on the bandwagon. But that's not the same thing as having their own convictions. Because we see that they didn't really have their own convictions because as they became adults, as it was time to pass it on to their kids, they didn't say anything. And I think that's a challenge that we have is when we just want our kids to accept the gospel and just become Christians and just get baptized, we're going to have a big issue in the church because they might not be having their own faith. They might just be agreeing that your faith is okay with them. And so we got to make sure that we're being really intentional in our discipleship, in our training, in our reaching out to the next generations. And if we wait till they're teens, we're waiting too late. We got to engage earlier and help them come not to our convictions, but to their own convictions. And you know how you know it wasn't their convictions? Because when the first generation died, the third generation stopped hearing about it. You know, with the generations, there's kind of three steps that we need if we're going to get to all the generations, right? The first step is they've got to be able to stand on their own convictions, So in other words, they need to be confronted with the situation when you're not there and still have the same belief, the same passion, the the same conviction about righteousness, about right and wrong, about who God is, about God's love, about God's mercy, without you whispering in their ears, now you know the right thing to believe is this. Now you know the right thing to do is this. That's why so many of our kids do great when they're at home and then they go off on campus and they go... Because they didn't learn to stand on their own convictions. And so because they couldn't stand without you, when they went away from you, they fell. Now, praise God in all his mercy, some of those kids who fall learn to stand for themselves. But wouldn't it be better to let them stand before we move them out? How many of you who are are adults have taught their kids how to ride a bike? If if you've taught your kid how to ride a bike, it's terrible. If you don't have, you have little kids and they're not at bike riding phase, it's like, just don't do it. They'll be happy. They don't need to ride a bike. It's fine. Do you know how many times as a dad, I'm like this, (sighs) And then, like, as soon as they feel you let go, they, like, t- they, like get off the way. I'm like, that's not how you learn. Like, like, and then, like, put the training. Like, my kids are like, no. Look, four wheels are better than two. Keep the training wheels on. Like, your car has four wheels. I don't see you trying to take two wheels off of that. <laughs> like, balance. Like, what? But, but there's this aspect of, but if you don't ever let them go, They never learn to ride for themselves, which is why so many of you parents are out of breath parenting. (sighs) I don't want you to fall. Okay, okay. I'm going to make sure you, okay, you know what's right. You know what's right. Okay, here's what to believe. Here's what to believe. Okay. No, 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 no. And they were like, I feel like a great parent. My kid never fell off their bike. They also never learned to ride a bike. (laughs) Can your kids stand on their convictions? But see, even if they can stand, it's going to die if they don't share their convictions. Where is the expectation amongst people who get baptized that everyone, if they're 12, or 22, or 52, or 102, that if you're a disciple of Jesus, and that's the best thing that ever happened to you, that you share it with everyone who will listen. That's just the expectation. Well, you know, my kid is young, and, you know, they're still figuring life out. Have they figured out that they're going to die without Jesus? Were they old enough and mature enough to understand the consequences of their sin and how it hurts people and hurts God? How it built a wall in their relationship with God and their relationship with people? And that the consequences of sin is death? 
death to the relationship with God and death to the relationships of people they love, well, then I think they're old enough to share the cure to that problem. The good news of Jesus, if they're old enough to, co- to grasp the concept of being lost and a sinner and how sin hurts, then surely they're old enough to share the cure for sin, which is the gospel of Jesus. That's what happened, right? It died. They agreed to it. Then when they got on their own, they were able to maintain a little bit. The third generation had never heard of God. But you know, this doesn't just happen in the Old Testament. It actually happens in the New Testament. It's really great. We have this aspect of, we get to see Ephesus in particular when it was planted in Acts 19. Now that was a cranking church. John, the apostle of love, Mary, mother of Jesus, and Paul. I mean, I don't know if I could have sinned in that church. I'd have been like, I want to, and I would look at Mary, I'm like, I'm so sorry, Lord. I'm like, come on. I mean, like, do you know, you know how much, I mean, I would have cried every week at communion. I seen Mary in the front row. I'm <laughs> sorry, we killed your baby. Ah! I would have, it would have been over. I, I don't even know how I would have sinned. Seriously, like, it's Mary. It's that the dude. We killed her kid, like her baby boy. And then, God forbid, if they just sang, like, Mary, did you know in the first century? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> Service is over. Let's go home. But in Ephesus, it starts off really good. We see the first thing that goes wrong is false teachers in 1 Timothy 1. That's roughly in the first decade. Turn over to Revelation chapter 2. It's drifting a little bit more from just having some false teachings and some, some, some slight doctrinal problems. By the time we're the second generation in this church is getting mature, it says this. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, you think about this. If we stop at the beginning of this, like, it's a great church. It's still a great, I mean, man, you guys are, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, that you don't tolerate wicked men. You've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. In other words, they kind of dealt with the big issue in 1 Timothy 1. They, they, they dealt with those false teachers. I mean, they seem to be making progress. But see, along the way, they lost their passion. They didn't stop doing all the good things. And that's what happens to us, doesn't it? I remember being 19, like Mach 3 with my hair on fire, and that's when I had hair. Right? Like, I was like, I was just like so fired up. Like, we're going to change the world. We're going to do this. And, and then I got married. I lost my hair. <laughs> I'll let you draw your own conclusions. People... People, people come to my house all the time. They see my wedding picture. They look at it. They're like, ooh, you had hair. Last day. <laughs> that was it. But there's something about getting married, and you know what it is. Like, being married is awesome, right? Like, being married is awesome. Like, you marry your best friend. You have common passions and values. I mean, just I, I love when I got married and married my best. It was just amazing. But you kind of like now you have, like, more stuff to juggle, because it's no longer just you. And then you have a kid and your world changes. You no longer say stupid things in the grocery store like, my kid will never do that. (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. 
Some of you were like judging those parents and you became those parents. <laughs> then you have two kids. Mmm. Some of you went crazy. <laughs> you just kept going and going and going. Some of you have more kids than you have parent hands. That's like faith. If you have four hands in the parents and you have five kids, God bless you. Like, you have great faith. I mean, I could never have more kids than hands because one of them would get away because they're my kids. But we get, here's what's really funny is our passion starts getting consumed with not just sinful things, but things. They just do. We get busy. We have work and kids and karate and marriage. And then, and then people keep telling you, like, you need to make time to date your wife. I'm like, okay, great. You need to spend time with each one of your kids individually. And I'm like, if you have five kids, like, you're done for the week. <laughs> I went to work. I got with my wife. I got with my kids. Game over. Like, right? But, but that's it. Like, then we, and what happens is we just, we just stop. We lose our passion. You know, when you get to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and in chapter 3 and chapter 4, the kids, of the, the kids of these parents who lost their first love were lovers of themselves and lovers of pleasure. These weren't bad parents. They just forgot what was most important. They forgot that God always had to be their greatest passion, and if their kids needed to see that passion. Amen. Are you with me here? And so here's the first challenge I have for you. Do it again. I just want you to do it again. Whatever you did at first, they got you so fired up, that just made you glow in the dark, that made you radioactive spiritually, do it again. You know what it is. I don't have to tell you. Was it your quiet times? Was it your evangelism? What is it that made people feel like, oh my gosh, these people are crazy? Do it again. Was it that you sold things for missions? Was it that you would share your faith with a tree? I mean, what was it? Do it again. Here's the thing is, you need it, but the next gener generation needs to see it. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about Hebrews chapter 5, but you don't have to go there. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. Hebrews chapter 5 is a great scripture because, again, it's kind of to those I've lost my first love Christians. And he says, you know, we have much to say about this, but it's hard to explain because you're slow to learn. By this time, you ought to be teachers, but you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food, because solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Are you guys with me here? So you didn't even have to read it, amen. But that, I love that scripture because you know what? We have to learn again. How many people, like you were doing good, you had a good week, a good month, a good year, and then like, you just like, meh, Anybody ever had one of those weeks, days, months, years, decades, right? Like, have you ever had, and you just feel like, man, I just, I got to get back. I got to get back to, how do I even, how do I even get back is you have to start at the beginning. You got to go back to the elementary teachings and go to your core convictions. And, and here's the thing, you don't get to do it by yourself. You actually have to be humble enough to say, hey, bro, I know that I've been a Christian 10 years, or I know I've been around a while but I've gotten so far away from where I need to be. Will you teach me the basics again? Because see, when someone teaches you the basics, it's kind of like when we study the Bible with people around here, we don't just be like, hey, that's good knowledge. We say, okay, the Bible is amazing, right? It's, it's our standard. It's, it's our foundation in which we build our lives. And we want to build a solid foundation so our marriages and our families can be strong. So are you willing to make the Bible your standard? And then They'll say, yeah, sure. And then the next time we get with them, we're like, did you read your Bible? Uh, oh, so I was really supposed to do it. Like, you remember when you were studying the Bible, somebody was like, and like, they like looked at you like, so now, like tomorrow, this week, before we get back together, you're actually going to do some radical thing. You're actually going to put this into practice. And this is what it looks like. 
We never outgrow that. But I know what I need to do. Yeah. That is not the same thing as doing it at all. And sometimes we just need someone to go like, look, I need you to ask me this week, did you invite somebody to church? Did you open the Bible, share a quiet time? Did you have consistent quiet times? Did you pray with your kids? Did you? Because if they don't ask and they're not engaged, we don't do it. We go week after week. Sometimes taking communion, going, God, help me again. Another week that I'm the same. Have mercy on me, a sinner. We need to learn again. We need to be taught again. But it's very interesting, because when we talk about teaching, Paul told Timothy this. He said that he, even though he was young, so I'm going to talk to the teens just for a second. You know, it's really interesting, teens, that young people were church leaders. And he said that, like, Timothy, even though he was younger than all these other guys, he said that he should be command and teach. He should have these deep convictions, but he didn't want him just to preach with his words. He said, set them an example. They were supposed to be preaching with their lives. There's no greater preachers than the teens. You guys with me here? Like, you guys got to have convictions. You got to preach. You got to you got to hold it in. You got to talk about it to everybody, even your parents. Your parents need you. Oh, my gosh, do they need you. Now, you need your parents a little bit. I mean, roof, money, <laughs> homework at the last minute, dr- taxi drivers, you know, free Uber. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You need your parents a little. But they desperately need to see your zeal and your example, just like the church in Ephesus needed to see Timothy. And what's very interesting about Timothy is he was a church leader and he'd been around a while and he had kind of grown up in the church, but he still needed to keep making progress. That's 1 Timothy 4. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. And that's what we need. We need to learn again. Now, here's the main point, and then we're going to be done. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we need to do again. We need to learn again. And we need to need again. We're going to start here in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. You know, I I love this scripture Because it teaches two principles that we never outgrow in generational discipleship. And that is every Christian needs all the other Christians. Every Christian here needs all the other Christians. And and let me tell you why. Because the church, the Christians were supposed to make known the manifold wisdom of God. Like collectively, people are supposed to look at us, not individually because that would be not good. But, like, collectively, they're supposed to see all the attributes of God and Jesus. And I always use this analogy. You might hear anybody, like, anybody like Yo-Yo Ma or some great violinist, and you just hear them play. It is so beautiful. When someone is really gifted with an instrument and they play, it's so moving and mesmerizing, but it can never be a symphony. No matter how good you are, solo, you can never make known the manifold wisdom of God. Because God is not interested in solos. He's interested in symphony. There's a connection. We're listening and we're playing together. We're playing this, this tune of love and grace. 
But unless we play it together, unless there is harmony and unity, the world will not know. And we got to come back. We need each other. Here's the other thing. Sometimes I think some of us, if you're like me, like, because I'm like all messed up, like, I get it. Like, I need discipling. God help the world. If I ever leave God and people stop getting in my life, it will be bad. I mean, because I, I'll just, it'll be a train wreck. It'll be so bad. I know I need. Here's the part that I don't always get. I'm needed. You are needed. If you're the weakest Christian here today, with the least amount of faith, with the worst convictions, the Bible says that the church won't work right if you're not here. If you just walk away or you quit altogether or you stop engaging or you stop trying to help someone other than yourself, the church is broken. Because it says the weakest part of the body is indispensable. And for a lot of us, we forget that we are needed in the body. We get so busy with our own lives, sometimes it just feels like we're being accomplished that we're still faithful this week. Anybody ever had one of those weeks? You're like, I'm here, and that is by the grace of God, and, and that's all I could do today. Like, I showed up. Yeah, I woke up. That's right. I woke up and I showed up and I'm done. That's all I got for you today. But, but, but here's the thing. If we, if we live in that mindset, guys, we're breaking something bigger than ourselves. There can be no harmony. There can be no symphony. Unless we all know not only that we need each other, but that we're needed. And I want to talk about this as far as generational discipleship. I didn't move from leading churches for 17 years to do youth and family better. I'm just going to be honest. I love leading churches. I love planted churches. I led small churches for 17 years, and I loved it. I love being out on the mission field and being in small groups and knowing everyone in my church and praying for them and their kids, sometimes their grandkids every day by name. I love that. I love being able to put my arm around it. So I didn't move Denver because I needed a job or because I thought we could do better in the youth and family ministry. I felt like there was too much at stake not to go after this. Because when we look in the Bible, getting to the ends of the earth has been done, but getting to all generations has never been done. And more than that, I just felt like we got to start earlier. We, we, we got to make this the culture of the church. I don't want to change the way that we do youth and family. I want to change the way we do church. Let me, let me just show you practically what I mean, just for one second. Then I promise I'll finish. I'm, I'm being honest this time. Maybe. This is how we do church. We have a Kingdom Kids ministry. Praise God. I'm so grateful for all the coordinators and teachers who teach. So my heroes, oh my gosh, um, the, the, the middle school ministry, the high school ministry, the teens, the campus, the singles, and the marrieds, and what we do is we do all of those separate. They have their own budgets, their own people, their own curriculum, their own way of doing things, and then we like bump into each other on Sunday. And that's not what the Bible says. It says that every part of the body needs all the other parts. And why ethnically and socially and economically, we are incredibly engaged and diverse in with one another, but generationally, we're more segregated than your work, your school. And any, you're not this segregated in any other part of your life. But in the church, we're doing this. And the truth of the matter is we need to do this. And this is the epitome of 1 Corinthians 13 because until we get the campus minister and Brian, and Brian has been amazing. I just want to tell you, Brian and Christina, amazing hearts. You're so blessed to have them. They're amazing. And I've come in and I've just talked to them and I just said, you know, until the campus minister says, my ministry is not just campus. 
but it's reaching back into the teens and reaching up into the young marrieds and in the singles. And that my part is to bridge the gap generationally, to reach back and to be a big part of the teens, but also help them for the next phases of their life and reach up to those people and have them teach me what my people are going to need to know and have them teach my people what they're going to need to know to be successful as professionals, as young marrieds. This church will never do cradle to campus if we don't change the culture where every ministry reaches up and reaches back. We need empty nesters to reach back with the teen parents and just say to us, it's going to be okay. I just, just tell me, just somebody lie to me. I don't, it, you don't even have to tell me. I give you permission. I just need somebody to tell me that my 13-year-old daughter, who's in the throes of middle school, I just, I just need somebody to be, it's going to be okay. Right? I, I, I just, but we, we need the older parents who have teens, even though you're in a di- in a difficult situation of trying to help your kids find their own faith, not to forget to reach back to the younger families. How many of us, when we got teens, were like, man, I would have done that differently. <laughs> have you ever looked back with your kids and like, if I could just go back and have a really strong talk with my, you know, 24-year-old self, <laughs> I would tell, whoop that kid more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I would say, you know, be more selective about the activities that they get. Anybody felt that way? But all the young parents need your wisdom. Why are we letting them make the same mistakes that we made? Why are we compounding generational mistakes instead of learning from each other and needing each other and understanding that we're needed? We need the young married to reach back and help the singles develop the kind of character so, and, and skills that when they get married, it's not like trial by fire. <laughs> I always think it's funny. There, there's like this contrast. My wife and I got, started dating and got engaged about the same time as one couple in the church. One couple in the church, they had like the perfect relationship. Like they never fought. Like they dated for a year. Zero fights. Me and my wife, we didn't have any trouble fighting. <laughs> I was an idiot enough for everybody. I was doing stupid stuff all the time. One time, I, 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 we got in this disagreement about the ministry, and I got really frustrated, and I, and I stormed off, and she started crying, and I thought, man, I, pro- I probably did something bad. <laughs> I don't know. Usually crying is not good. And so I went to turn myself in. I I drove to the guy who was mentoring me, the older guy in the church who was mentoring me, and I pulled up, and Kim was already there. (laughs) She was there. And the sister that was mentoring her, an older married sister, answered the door, and she just looked at me, and she goes, he's back there. (laughs) Oh, But dating couples need to learn to communicate and share values and still be pure. And that's not easy. And they need our support and our encouragement even before they get there. We need to reach back. Some of us, we need to reach up too. You know, it's really funny. I had a brother in my church and he was in his mid-60s. He had been an elder in another church and uh, we were just talking about mentors, and, and like everybody needs a mentor, everybody needs this, and he's like, like they're all dead. Like <laughs> I'm the oldest. <laughs> I'm in a small church. I'm the oldest dude here, and then like most of my friends who are in the re- like I'm like the. <laughs> I reached up. There was nobody there. But for a lot of us, we we're probably some of us are past the age of mentors but we're never past the age of coaching. Reaching up means you might be younger than me, but you're better at this than me. Teach me now, because I'm never too old to learn. I'm never too old to grow. Does that make sense? 
So that's what I, that's my goal. If you say, Sonny, what is your goal? This cradle to cancer, uh, cradle to campus thing. What is your goal? Is to change the way we do church, where every church member, every disciple knows that they're needed and that they need one another. That we're not fighting for the best solo Christianity, that we're fighting for symphony and harmony because that makes known the manifold wisdom of God. So I'm going to leave you with these challenges here. And I'll turn the page. There they are, right there. Oh, amen. If you're an older Christian, do it again. Don't ever outgrow stupid, crazy, zealous passion for God. God forbid you ever look at a campus student or a teen and all of their zeal and gratitude and think, "Ah, look at them, young and dumb, they'll learn. Hopefully they'll never learn to be lukewarm or forsake their first love. What they need, what we all need is someone that shows us the way of how to find it again when we lose it. We need people who will do it again. We need to learn again. Amen, church? If you're visiting with us and you're like, man, I, I don't even know where to start in the Bible, you know, I want to I encourage you to ask whoever invited you to study the Bible and get in there and have those convictions to be able to know the elementary teachings. Hey, we all might not have PhDs in Bibles, but there's some things about the Bible. You know, uh, Hebrews 6, 1 through 3, it talks about, it actually outlines what the elementary teachings about Jesus is. And I would encourage you to ask somebody, hey, I just want to study the Bible and know the basics. I want to be able to share the gospel and the basics of Christianity confidently from God's word. Amen? And for some of us, if we've gotten lost and we know we should be doing a lot more, we know we should be leaders, we know we should be helping mentor somebody else, I want you to ask somebody, be humble enough to ask somebody to go, teach me again. Hold me accountable again. And lastly, I want to challenge you to know that you're needed and that you need everyone else. I want to challenge you to start, help me create the culture in our church and in our movement of churches where every disciple sees that they need to reach up and reach back so that we can have generational lift instead of generational drift. Amen.